This is the Bible in one year, day 246. How your life can make a difference. Alfred Nobel is best known for the Nobel Peace Prize. Less well known is the fact that Alfred Nobel also invented dynamite. As well as a chemist, engineer and innovator, he was a weapons manufacturer. In 1888, Alfred's brother, Ludwig, died. A French newspaper erroneously published Alfred's obituary. It condemned him for his invention of dynamite, stating, The merchant of death is dead, Dr. Alfred Nobel, who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before, died yesterday. Alfred Nobel was devastated by the foretaste of how he would be remembered. His last will and testament set aside the bulk of his estate to establish the Nobel Prizes. He gave the equivalent of $250 million to fund such prizes. Alfred Nobel had the rare opportunity to evaluate his life near its end and live long enough to change that assessment. Have you ever wondered what difference your life might make? How can your life bring blessing to other people? How can you change the world for the better? How can your life be of ultimate lasting value? How can we lead fruitful lives? From Psalm 105. When they were but few in number, few indeed, and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake, he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of peoples set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Fruitfulness comes from faithfulness to God. If your life is to be fruitful, you have to stay faithful to God in the difficult times. It's relatively easy to be faithful to God when all is going well in life. The test comes when you face fierce temptation and great trials. As the psalmist gives thanks to God for his faithfulness to his people, he recalls the life of Joseph. Joseph's life was immensely fruitful. Pharaoh made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. As a result, the Lord made his people very fruitful. But Joseph's fruitfulness came at a price. In the early days, it didn't seem like his life would be at all fruitful. He was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Joseph went through betrayal, slavery, temptation, imprisonment, and a great deal of suffering. Yet in all this, he remained faithful. The reason for Joseph's faithfulness was that he trusted that God was in control, even in the bad times. And eventually, the word of the Lord proved him true. Not only did Joseph remain faithful to God despite his seeming abandonment, but he also remained faithful to his family in totally forgiving them rather than blaming and rejecting them. Ultimately, his faithfulness led to great fruitfulness. Lord, thank you for your amazing faithfulness to me. Help me to be faithful to you, even in the difficult times of temptation, disappointment and discouragement. Like Joseph, may my life be fruitful. New Testament from 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, 
in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends... Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Fruitfulness comes from the Holy Spirit. Your life can be immensely fruitful because the Holy Spirit lives within you. You are a temple in whom God lives. Just as in the Old Testament God dwelt in the Holy of Holies, so now he dwells in you and me by his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces beautiful fruit in your life. Paul's life was arguably one of the most fruitful in the history of the world. He describes himself as a servant of God. In his lifetime, he made many rich. The riches for Paul were the spiritual riches of being in Christ. His life continues to make many rich. The fruit of Paul's life has lasted 2,000 years and will enjoy into eternity. Like Joseph, Paul's fruitfulness came at a price. He lists some of the things he endured. Hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, jailed and mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating, slandered, distrusted, ignored by the world, beaten within an inch of our lives, immersed in tears, living on handouts, having nothing. As I look at Paul's life, I feel so challenged. It puts all my problems into perspective. In all this suffering, Paul remained faithful in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God. He remained genuine and always rejoicing. He says, we're penniless. In reality, we have everything worth having. Paul says to the Corinthians, we've spoken freely to you and opened wide our hearts to you. We're not withholding our affection from you. He's open and vulnerable with the Corinthians and pleads with them to open their hearts to him in the same way. He says, open up your lives, live openly and expansively. To act with integrity, you must first know who you are. You must know what you stand for, what you believe in, and what you care most about. Bear Grylls writes, people tend to think they have to be funny, witty, or incisive on stage. You don't. You just have to be honest. If you can be intimate and give the inside story, emotions, doubts, struggles, fears, the lot, then people will respond. The Holy Spirit is the one who sets you free to be yourself. He's the one who produces fruitfulness in your life. Paul does not want anything 
to spoil this fruitfulness in the lives of the Corinthians. He pleaded with them, don't become partners with those who reject God. He's not suggesting that they remove themselves from the world. Rather, he's warning of the dangers of long-term partnerships with those who reject God. Many people have ignored these warnings, for example, in terms of marriage partners, and some have ended up within months or years no longer going to church and eventually losing their faith. It's heartbreaking to watch. So Paul writes, leave the corruption compromise. Leave it for good. He goes on, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us, both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit and holy temples for the worship of God. Lord, fill me with your power through your Holy Spirit. Enable me to be pure, patient, kind, and truthful, and to love sincerely with a wide open heart. Old Testament from Isaiah 3 to 5. See now, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of fifty and the man of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman and clever enchanter. I will make mere youths their officials. Children will rule over them. People will oppress each other. Man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old. The nobody against the honored. A man will seize one of his brothers in his father's house and say, You have a cloak. You be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day, he will cry out, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. Jerusalem staggers. Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Tell the righteous it will be well with them for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked! Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. Youths oppress my people, women rule over them. My people, your guides, lead you astray. They turn you from the path. The Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? Declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The Lord says, The women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, strutting along with swaying hips, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Therefore the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion. The Lord will make their scalps bald. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and headbands and crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and anklets and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and cloaks, the purses and mirrors, and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. Instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. Isaiah chapter 4 In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, We will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. 
In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and rain. Isaiah chapter 5 I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Fruitfulness comes from closeness to Jesus. God loves you. He wants you to stay close to him. He wants you to be a branch in his vine, producing fruit. When we're unfaithful to him, it's like being cut off from the vine. We become unfruitful. Isaiah writes, the one I love had a vineyard, a fine, well-placed vineyard. He looked for a vintage crop of grapes, but for all his pains, he got junk grapes. He looked for a crop of justice, and saw them murdering each other. He looked for a harvest of righteousness and heard only the moans of victims. The word for justice means to make right. Justice is a relational term, living in a right relationship with God and one another, showing love and compassion for the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. Much of the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are about God's judgment. God enters the courtroom. He takes his place at the bench to judge his people. God calls for order in the court, hauls the leaders of his people into the dock. God's people have been unfaithful to him. You've played havoc with this country. Your houses are stuffed with what you've stolen from the poor. What is this anyway? Stomping on my people, grinding the faces of the poor into the dirt. They've enjoyed great material riches which have led to pride, immorality, and greed. Isaiah sees a coming judgment, and on that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. This was only partially fulfilled at that time. Like many other prophecies, it points forward to what we can now see was achieved through Jesus, who was the true branch of the Lord. Jesus is the branch from the vine of God. We are the branches from the vine of Jesus. Jesus is the true branch and the true vine. He is the one who was totally faithful and fruitful beyond any human being, even Joseph or Paul. He now invites you to be part of his vine, to stay close to him and to bear much fruit, fruit that will last. Lord, I want my life to make a difference. Thank you that you've made that possible. Keep me close to you, faithful and filled with the Holy Spirit bearing fruit that will last. Pepper adds.
2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 it says let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit I need a detox before the start of the beginning of term I don't need to just cut down on things like chocolate I possibly need to cut them out <laughs>